Hello and welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. In the past few years, I've been feeling as if my mind is being scattered when I'm trying to get through a busy day at work on the one hand, and on the other hand, clutching and checking my phone constantly and my emails. So imagine the sense of serendipity when Johan Hari's latest book, Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention, landed on my desk. Johan Hari is the author of three New York Times best-selling books. His books have been translated into 38 languages and have been praised by a broad range of people from Oprah to Noam Chomsky, from Elton John to Stephen Fry. Johan, thank you so much for joining us and coming to chat I'm about so your book. I'm so happy to be here, Jill. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. So, as I said, um, I, I really identified with this and, and uh, the scattered attention and love the way that you go to Prince, uh, a province town in near Boston to get away from this. Tell me about how the, this book got inspired. Yeah, like you and like I'm guessing almost everyone watching, I noticed something was going wrong with my attention. It felt like with each year that passed, things that require deep focus that are so important to me, like having proper long conversations, reading books, watching films, was getting more and more like kind of running up a down escalator. You know what I mean? I could still do it, but it was getting harder and harder. And I discovered this is happening to huge numbers of people. Um, you know, the average office worker now focuses on only one task for only three minutes. For every one child who was identified with serious attention problems, when I was seven years old, there's now a hundred children who've been identified with this problem. And for a long time I was thinking about this, but to be honest, I was a bit ashamed of the problem. I thought there was something wrong with me. And there was a moment when I realized I had to, to write about this. I've got a godson, and when he was nine, he developed this brief, incredibly cute obsession with Elvis Presley. And it was particularly cute because he didn't know that impersonating Elvis had become a kind of cheesy cliche. So I think he was the last person to do a totally sincere impression of Elvis. He would do it all the time. And at night when I tucked him in, it would get me to tell him the story of Elvis's life over and over again. And <laughs> one night I was telling him about, I mentioned Graceland where Elvis lived. And he said to me, hey, will you take me to Graceland one day? And I said, sure, the way you do with nine-year-olds, no, next week it'll be Legoland or whatever. And he said, no, do you swear do you swear that one day you'll take me to Graceland? And I said, I absolutely swear. And I didn't think of that moment again for 10 years until so many things had gone wrong. So he dropped out of school when he was 15. And by the time he was 19, he spent literally almost all his waking hours alternating between his iPad, his iPhone, his laptop. And his life was just this, this blur of WhatsApp, YouTube, pornography. And it, it almost felt like he was kind of whirring at the speed of Snapchat, when nothing still or serious could touch him. And one day we were sitting on my sofa in London, and just all day I was trying to get a conversation going with him, and I couldn't. And to be honest with you, Jill, I wasn't that much better. Right? I was staring at my own devices. And I, and I suddenly remembered this moment all these years before, and I said to him, hey, let's go to Graceland, right? Let's break this numbing routine. Let's just get, in fact, let's go all over the South. And, and he thought about it, and he said, yeah, I'd like to do that. And I said, okay, but there's one condition, which is if we go, you've got to leave your phone in the hotel during the day. There's no point in us going if you can stare at your phone the whole time. And he said, yeah, I promise I'm going to do it. And so I think it was literally two weeks later, we, went, we landed in New Orleans. And uh, a couple of weeks after that, we got to Graceland. And when you get to the gates of Graceland, this is even before COVID, uh -huh. there's no one to show you around. What happens is uh, they hand you an iPad, and you put in earbuds, and the iPad shows you around. It says, go left go right, tells you about the room you're in, and every room you're in, there's a picture of that room on the iPad. So we're walking around, and it's really strange. I can realize oh, no one's actually looking at Graceland. They're all just staring at their iPads. <clears throat> and I'm getting a little bit kind of irritable. And we got to the jungle room that was Elvis's favorite room in Graceland. It's full of fake plants. And I'll never forget this. There was a Canadian couple next to us, and the man turned to his wife, and he said, Honey, this is amazing. Look, if you swipe left, you can see the jungle room to the left. And if you swipe right, you can see the jungle room to the right. And I, I laughed out loud. I thought they were kidding. And I turned and looked, and they were just swiping. And I, I leaned over, and I said, but hey, sir, there's a, an old-fashioned form of swiping you could do. It's called <laughs> turning your head, because we're actually in the jungle room. You don't have to look at it on an iPad. We're, we're literally there. And they looked at me like I was crazy, possibly correctly, and backed out the room. And I, and I turned to my godson to laugh about it. And he was standing in the corner staring at Snapchat, because from the minute we landed, he could not stop. He just couldn't stop. And I, 
and I went up to him and I tried to grab the phone out of his hands, never a good idea with a teenager. And, and I said, look, I know you're afraid of missing out, but this is guaranteeing that you'll miss out, mm -hmm. right? The, the, th this is no way to live. You're not present at the events of your own existence. And he stormed off and I wandered around Memphis on my own that day and I found him that night at the Heartbreak Hotel where we were staying, sitting by the, the swimming pool. And he was looking at his phone and I went up to him and I apologized for getting so angry. And he didn't look up, but he said, I know something's really wrong and I don't know what it is. And that's when I thought, I can't put this off anymore. I need to actually investigate the science of what's happening to our attention everywhere. Mm. So yes, this attention so uh, um, uh, it made me think as well. So I sit and I try and close myself down to think mm. and, and concentrate on something. But the constant interruptions to your day as a worker and then somebody comes to you, you look up and you, you're distracted from your focus. And you say that when that happens, it takes you up to 23 minutes to get back into your state of focus. Is this correct? It's an incredible study by mm -hmm. Professor Michael mm -hmm. Posner at the University of Oregon. If you're interrupted, it takes you on average 23 minutes to get back to the level of focus you had before you were interrupted. But most of us never get 23 minutes for exactly the reasons you're saying. And one of the people who really helped me to understand this is I went to MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to interview Professor Earl Miller, who's one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. And he said to me, look, there's one thing you've got to understand about the human brain more than anything else. You can only consciously think about one or two things at a time. That's it. This is a fundamental limitation of the human brain. The human brain has not changed significantly in 40,000 years. It's not going to change on any time scale we're going to see. But what's happened is we've fallen for kind of massive delusion. The average teenager now believes they can follow six or seven forms of media at the same time. And people our age aren't so far behind. Um, so what happens is scientists like Professor Miller get people into labs, teenagers and older people, and they get them to think they're doing more than one thing at a time. And what they discover is always the same. You can't do more than one thing at a time. What you do is you juggle very quickly between tasks. You're like, what did this person just say to me in the text? What did Jill just ask me? What does it say on the TV over there? What's this new email? Wait, Jill, what did you ask me again? So we're constantly juggling. And it turns out that comes with a really big cost. The technical term for it is the switch cost effect. When you try and do more than, more than one thing at a time, you do all the things you're trying to do much less competently. You make more mistakes. You remember less of what you do. You're much less creative. And this isn't a small effect. One small study, for example, found being chronically interrupted in the short term is twice as bad for your intelligence as getting stoned. You'd be better off sitting at your desk getting stoned than you would being constantly interrupted. Although clearly neither is good for you, right? <laughs> this is why Professor Miller said to me, we're living in a perfect storm of cognitive degradation as a result of being interrupted all the time. And, and it's interesting because actually, as you know, I interviewed over 200 scientists, experts, on attention all over the world. They use my training in the social sciences at Cambridge University to really get to the bottom of this. And that is one of the 12 factors that have been, for which there's scientific evidence that are profoundly harming our ability to focus and pay attention. So of course, then I was asking, okay, how do we solve this? And mm -hmm. most of the book is about that. Yeah, so most of the time we work at diminished brain capacity then. Profoundly okay. diminished, yeah, exactly. It, actually, much more than we even realize. I mean, when I first interviewed scientists about this, I remember thinking, okay, I get it, but that's a small effect, right? Actually, uh, the evidence suggests it's a really, really big effect. I mean, this is having a, a huge drag on our day. This sense, this kind of, a lot of people have a kind of anecdotal sense of my attention isn't as good as it seems to be. I thought maybe my attention is getting worse because I'm getting older. But actually, the book is called Stolen Focus because I want people to understand our attention didn't, your attention didn't collapse. Your attention has been stolen from you by some really big forces. Now that includes some aspects of how our technology is currently designed. I'm sure we can talk about why it's designed that way and what we can do about it. But actually loads of things I'd never even thought about from um, the food we eat is profoundly harming our ability to pay attention. The air pollution we're exposed to is profoundly harming our ability to pay attention. The way we work in all sorts of ways, the way our schools are designed. There's so many aspects of the way we're living that are causing as Professor Miller put it, this perfect storm. But once you understand what's causing these problems, you begin to understand, firstly, it's not your fault, right? Because mm. I would just get angry with myself. I'd be like, well, what's wrong with me? Why can't I resist this? But when you're, firstly, it's not your fault. And secondly, for all of these 12 factors that are harming our attention and focus, I think there's kind of two levels at which we've got to respond to them. I think of them as defense and offense, right? 
So there are loads of things we can do to defend ourselves and our children at an individual level from these factors. Um, I go through loads in the book, but I'll give you an example of one. Um, I feel like a bit like a QVC product placement person, but I don't get any money from these people. So if you go online, you can buy something called a K-safe. It's a plastic safe. You take off the lid, you put in your phone, you put on the lid, you turn the dial at the top and it locks your phone away for anything between five minutes and a whole day, right? I won't sit, when my friends come around for dinner, everyone's got to put their phone in the phone jail. I won't sit down with my partner to watch a film unless we all imprison our phones. And, and um, it's difficult at first, but then the pleasures of attention are so much greater than the pleasures of distraction. I would say to anyone watching, think about anything you've ever achieved in your life that you're proud of, whether it's you know starting a business, being a good parent, learning to play the guitar, whatever it is, that thing that you're proud of required a huge amount of sustained focus and attention. And when focus and attention break down, your ability to achieve your goals breaks down. Your ability to solve your problems breaks down. You feel worse about yourself because you do actually become significantly more incompetent. So that's one level, defense. The other level is offense. We've got to take on the big forces that are doing this to us. We don't have to tolerate living in an environment where we're being constantly interrupted, where we're using technology that is designed to hack and invade our and our children's attention. That can sound very big and fancy, but I go through in the book very practical ways we can take that on. So I think we've got to have both those levels for, for all of these 12 factors. Well, let's look now at the technology sure. and how it's designed. So your chapter on how Google operates and Facebook and um, to, to really get us to stay. And it's not necessarily the algorithm they use are not necessarily the best for ourselves, for our mental health, but it is it addresses the worst part of, of, of our psyche. You put it really well. Uh, I interviewed loads of people in Silicon Valley who designed key aspects of the world in which we live. Uh, things that, you know, your viewers, their kids are using all the time. And one of the things that was fascinating was how ashamed and disgusted they are by what they've done. I'll give you an example. Dr. James Williams, who was a senior strategist at Google, spoke at a tech conference full of designers who've literally designed stuff that people watching are using today. And he said to them, if there's anyone here who wants to live in the world that we're creating, please put up your hand. And nobody put up their hand. It's very striking. So interviewing these people, I learned a lot of the mechanisms that are harming our attention and crucially what we can do about it. So give an example, anyone watching, please don't for all the reasons <laughs> I've just talked about. But if you, if you opened Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, any of the mainstream apps now, uh, and you start looking at them, they start to make money out of you in two ways. The first way is really obvious. You see advertising, okay, everyone knows how that works. The second way is much more important. Everything you do on these apps is scanned and sorted by their artificial intelligence algorithms to build up information about you. And crucially, to figure out what the weaknesses in your attention are. What is it that keeps Jill scrolling? Is it cat videos? Is it uh, clips of Donald Trump? I don't <laughs> doubt it is, but whatever it is. Uh, it fig it's figuring out the weaknesses in your attention to keep you scrolling. For the very simple reason that for all these apps, the longer you scroll and the longer your kids scroll, the more money they make. And every time you close the app or your kids close the app, that revenue stream disappears. So all of these algorithms, all of this AI, all of this extraordinary genius in Silicon Valley is geared towards one thing and one thing only in the social media companies, figuring out how do we get Jill to scroll as long as possible and put down her phone as rarely as possible. That's it, that's the business model. Just like the head of KFC, all he cares about is how much fried chicken did you buy today? How big was the bucket you bought? That's it. You know, he may as an individual care about other things, but professionally, that's all he cares about. These companies are designed and brilliant at harvesting our attention. So once you understand that, you can see, look, there's a lot we can do to protect ourselves that I talk about, but as my friend Tristan Harris, who was at the heart of Google and left to speak out because he was so sickened, as he said, you know, you can try having self-control, but every time you do, there's 10,000 amazing engineers on the other side of the screen trying to undermine your self-control. That's why we've got to regulate these companies because we can have all the technology we currently have. I'm not anti-tech. I don't want us all to join the Amish and <laughs> run away from technology. I want us to have technology that works for us not technology that works against us. So you've got to have smart regulation to do that. There are places that are moving in that direction. Um, there's lots we can do. And for all of the 12 factors, while there are individual things we can do, I want to be really honest with people. I am passionately in favor of individual changes. They will really help. I've done a lot of them. I write about a lot of them in the book. But at the moment, it's like someone is pouring itching powder over us all day. 
and then leaning forward and saying, hey, you might want to learn how to meditate, then you wouldn't scratch so much. You want to go, yeah, the meditation is great, but we've got to stop the people who are pouring itching powder on us. And it requires a shift in consciousness. This isn't your fault. You're not weak. You're not stupid. You're not failing because your attention is being degraded. Your attention is being attacked. We've got to fight back. And we've got to remember, we are not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies and we own our own minds and we can take them back if we want to. Fantastic. Johan, we have uh, come to the end of our, oh. of our time. So um, it's going beyond just doing things for yourself and meditating um, and all of those things. Uh, this is a crucial part of it. But as Johan is saying, it is also a societal thing and we have to address those societal problems that lead us to lose focus. So my guest is Johan Hari and the book is Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention. Thanks for joining us, Johan. Oh, thank pleasure. you. It's great so much, to have Jill. you here. Cheers. <laughs> and thank you for watching and see you again soon.